In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. You know, Heavenly Father, we just take a moment here this evening to, um, to say thank you for your continued love uh, for us, especially as we kind of conclude our Christmas season here with uh, your son Jesus, little baby Jesus. Uh, we thank you for the gift of our parish and the um, many families who bless our parish with their presence and their time and their gifts. And we thank you for the gift of this study to be able to come together and uh, to study your word and to be together as a really a parish family. We pray for your special blessing upon us as we take a look at the 10th chapter now of Luke's gospel, that it might be a nourishment for us and give us great joy in making your uh, son Jesus' name known and loved. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. St. Therese, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I was telling the morning folks, uh, isn't it nice to be together back again? As uh, We've been through a lot, especially if you've been here at St. Therese with, um, you know, the conclusion of Advent and then all those Christmas liturgies and the decorating. And I know you had a ton of family stuff, I'm sure, just like I did. And uh, to be together with your families and then Epiphany with the New Year's and then Epiphany and now the Feast of the Baptism of the Lord. This is a busy time of the year, isn't it? But it is nice to uh, come together uh, once in a while to just take a deep breath and um, to share what's going on in our, our lives and, and things like that, and then also to get a chance to take a look at God's Word uh, together. Uh, so let's take a look at uh, last time that we were together was a late Advent. We looked at uh, Luke chapters 8 and 9. Remember that? So we doubled up on your homework there. And we also looked at how Luke uh, uses... Uh, Mark and follows very closely along with Mark, namely uh, chapters 4, 5, 6. So he skips part of 6. He skips all of Mark 7 and then picks back up again with Mark 8 and 9. So it's like he has Mark's scroll right next to him and he's kind of not copying, he wouldn't say copying, right? But he's using that as a reference and then he's putting his own sort of Lucan twists on that. Uh, we talked about how uh, scholars will call a large omission, like the end of chapter 6 and all of chapter 7 of Mark is omitted. And you really, I, don't, I don't understand why he did this. He just, he just did, right? He just kind of cut out those parts of Mark. As something, God willing, you make it to heaven, you can ask Luke one day, like, what were you thinking there? What happened there? Or did you, you miss that part of the scroll? Or is it smudged? Or what, what happened there with that part? And then he picks up again with chapters 8, 9, uh, 10, uh, and then he skips just a little bit of, of, of Mark, Mark uh, 9 and 10 there and then picks up again, which brings us to the travel narrative, which we talked about last time, was this 10 chapters where Jesus is traveling to Jerusalem. And this is unique to Luke's gospel, this long journey that he has to Jerusalem. And uh, we had a map up here, so he starts up in Galilee. Uh, he's been up there in Galilee teaching in their synagogues. Uh, he's been preaching about the kingdom of God. He performs all kinds of miracles up there. Uh, do you remember how many miracles he performed up there? 17. 17 miracles up there in Galilee. And then in uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 51, which is a significant ver a chapter and verse in Luke's gospel, it says that Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem. In other words, I am going to do this. We are now going to head to Jerusalem. And from that point on, he will travel for 10 chapters all the way to Jerusalem. So now for the next couple of months, we're going to be in this what they call travel narrative now. There are some unique things to Luke's gospel uh, in this travel narrative. In fact, a lot of the Luke and things that we love from his gospel are found in this section of Luke's gospel, namely what we just read today, right? The Good Samaritan is in there. Martha and Mary are in this section of Luke's gospel. Uh, we have the persistent friend who keeps bugging the guy, you know, like saying, hey, I need something for my family, uh, who gets up in the middle of the night. Uh, the rich fool who tears down barns and then builds uh, bigger ones is in this particular uh, gospel. Luke chapter 15, which we're going to get to in a few weeks here, is the famous 
probably the most famous of all the chapters of Luke's gospel with the three lost things, right? You have the lost sheep, the lost coin, and then of course, right, the lost boy or the lost son, the prodigal son, uh, is in this part of Luke's gospel. We have the rich man and Lazarus and then the cleansing of 10 lepers. So lots of distinctive Lucan material in this section of his gospel. We also talked about how this section of these 10 chapters of this travel narrative are really about teaching. There's a lot of teaching that happens here. Uh, he cuts way back on the miracles. There's only five miracles in this section of Luke's gospel. And instead he does a lot more teaching of, about the kingdom of God. And he teaches about what does it mean to be a disciple, to follow him, and the cost of discipleship. And, and then in fact, he's, he keeps teaching them about the fact that he's going to Jerusalem and he's going to suffer and die for them. So there's a lot of remedial teaching here uh, that's happening uh, for the disciples and for the reader, right, for you and I as well. Matthew, for his part, will takes a lot of this material that's in these 10 chapters and he puts it in his Sermon on the Mount, which is chapters 5, 6, and 7. So that's the big teaching part of Matthew's Gospel. We won't do Matthew's Gospel next year. What did we agree on next year we're going to do? The Acts of the Apostles, right? So Luke part 2, really. So we'll look at the Acts of the Apostles next year. Okay, that brings us now to uh, Luke chapter 10. If you have your Bibles there, we'll just take a look at this. This mission of the 72, which again is unique to Luke, where he has this mission of the 12 in chapter 9, and then the mission of the 72 in Luke chapter 10. It says, verse 1, after this, the Lord, or Jesus, appointed 70, and then I'm sure in your scriptures there you have a little bracket. Maybe a little bracket there where it says two. Can we talk about that? Uh, 72 others whom he sent ahead of him in pairs to every town and place he intended to visit. Uh, just the background there. So the background there would be uh, the book of Numbers, where Moses uh, appoints 70 elders to help him in the administration of, of the people in the Old Testament around the tent of meeting there. So you have this kind of precedent with Moses appointing these leaders uh, to help him to uh, bring about, in some sense, the kingdom of God. And now we have the new Moses with Jesus appointing 70 or 72. What is the scoop with the brackets there? Uh, the, the thing is the commentators will note that the ancient manuscripts where we get this uh, material from some of the manuscripts have 70, and some of the manuscripts have 72. So there's a little bit of a disagreement amongst the um, ancient manuscripts. Is did he send out 70, or did he send it out 72? So it depends on what manuscript you look at. So they didn't. They're a little bit off there, right? In terms of just in terms of the number there, but it's not a big deal. I will also point this out. Uh, added this this morning. This little slide here. Um, a little background here. So. Um, uh, Genesis chapter 10, the context here is we had Noah's ark, right? And so the Lord tells Noah to build this ark uh, because he's going to, in some sense, start over uh, with the whole world. And Noah's wife goes onto it, onto the ark, and Noah's wife's name is Joan, Joan of Ark. That's her name. And so that is her name there, Joan of Ark. And then we had three of his sons also get in there with their respective wives. You have Shem, S-H-E-M. Shem is the oldest son. Then you have Hamburger is the second one, second son. And then you have Japheth is the last one. So after the flood, uh, the dove goes out and it says, okay, the waters have receded. And then it's from these three boys or these three sons and their respective daughters that the entire world is repopulated. And there's 70 nations or 70 descendants from this Noah's family. And I found this little map here, which is the orange ones. Those are going to be the descendants of Ham. There, they kind of settled there near, near the Mediterranean Sea. The green will be Japheth's sons and where they settled, kind of uh, would be they kind of moved up towards uh, Europe and, and that area and then you have Shem which is 
the promised line, right? That's where all the Israelites come from is the line of Shem. So you have this 70 nations or these 70 descendants that come from these three uh, sons. And Jesus sends out how many? 70 to what? Evangelize the world. So I think the idea here is that Luke is pointing to the evangelization of the whole known world at the time here. Because before he sent out 12 apostles, right, to evangelize the Israelites, the Jewish people. And now one chapter later, he sends out 70 to evangelize the nations, right? So the whole world is to come know Jesus. So that is sort of the background there. Let's look at verse 2. Jesus said to them, the harvest is abundant, but the laborers are few. So ask the master of the harvest to send out laborers for his harvest. Go on your way. Behold, I am sending you like lambs among wolves. Carry no money bag, no sack, no sandals. Greet no one along the way. To whatever house you enter, first say peace to this household. If a peaceful person lives there, your peace will rest on him. But if not, it will return to you. Stay in the same house and eat and drink what is offered to you. For the laborer deserves his payment. Do not move about from one house to another. Whatever town you enter and they welcome you, eat what is set before you, cure the sick in it, and say to them, The kingdom of God is at hand for you. Whatever town you enter and they do not receive you, go out into the streets and say, The dust of your town that clings to our feet, even that we shake off against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God is at hand. I tell you, it will be more tolerable for Sodom on that day than for that town. Let's take a look at this a little bit closer, the 70, sending of the 72 here. Actually, what I did is I, this is not on your notes, but it's just on this slide here. What is I did is I compared the difference between the, 70, the, sending, of the, sev, the sending of the 12 and the sending of the 72. So let's take a look at some of these differences. When he sends out the 12, he gives them all power and authority over the demons and to cure diseases. He sends out the 72, and it says that, and then the red is where the differences are. He sends them out in pairs. Now that's interesting. Why would he send them out in pairs? Think about that for a second. What do you think? Community. If you go out with a friend, life is just a lot better with a friend. It just is. You have encouragement. You have support. Uh, you can be praying for each other. Advice. Um, you get down. Your friend can say, it's all right, man. We're going to make, we're going to get through this. It's all right. You can listen to each other. The sense of pairs. Uh, Christianity is a team sport. I sometimes say that, you know, especially Catholicism is very much a team sport. It's a community affair that we're all in this together. Uh, every once in a while, I'll have somebody say, well, he or she lived their faith, but they don't come to church, but they have a very strong faith. And I say to myself, how can you have a strong faith and live your faith in a beautiful way without a community, without the support of others, right? We are all in this together, right? And it, the image that I have that a priest once gave to me is you, if you have a, a, a bunch of logs in a fire and they're all burning and you're like, they keep you warm and things like that. If you take one of the logs out of the fire, what does it eventually do? It cool. It just takes a while, though, doesn't it? It doesn't just happen right away. It cools down slowly, glows for a little while, and then what happens? It eventually dies out. So if you take the log away from the community or away from the wood of the fire, it eventually will die out when it's alone by itself. Our community of the church, especially the mass, is the fire. It's the furnace. It's where we receive God's word and, and listen to him, and he speaks to us. And it's where we receive his body and blood, right? Himself, where we are nourished. That's the fire. That's the furnace. And so we're nourished in that fire and in that community. And then you go out glowing, right? Your glow is your joy. Your joy is your glow and your glow is your joy. So you leave that. So I always say, how, how can you keep your fire burning all by yourself? Like we're all in this together. So the Lord doesn't call us out one by one, but he calls us out by two by twos. And really, at the end of the day, he calls us out as a body, as a church, as a community that's called out. So the idea that we would just do this alone would be very foreign to Christ, and it's very foreign to the early Christians as well. They'd say, what the heck are you talking about? That's, that's weird. Like, we're in this together, right? we got to hang together in this. And so we support each other. They proclaim the kingdom of God. 
The kingdom of God at hand is, is a hand for you. Heal the sick, cure the sick in it. And then you have this idea of this simplicity uh, here, a, a sense of simplicity is it speaks volumes, no walking stick, sack, food, money, or second tunic. What's interesting is you have no money bag, sack, sandals, and then he says what? Greet no one along the way. Somebody came up to me this morning and said, really? Like we can't like just have like a friendly conversation, right? And we can't, what, what is the scoop with that? Why is Jesus say, why is he kind of just like, just keep moving? And I said, well, sometimes our Lord speaks in what they call hi hyperbole, where it's just that, that added emphasis there, and just like, like an accent mark there, and italics we use sometimes in letter writing or you know in word processing, to just kind of make a point. Like, it's obviously okay to greet people, but don't get distracted, right, into conversations that are just going to take you away from the mission. Stay focused on the mission, right? You can often get uh, sidetracked a lot of times in all kinds of conversations. Stay in the same house. Peace to, this, peace to this household. Stay in the same house. If you think about it, ask yourself, why do they have to stay in the same house? What would be the temptation if they didn't stay in the same house? This house isn't too bad, but it's not Lake Minnetonka. So if I get an offer from Lake Minnetonka House, what am I going to do? Much better lodgings. I'm going to improve my sort of fair, if you will, right? I'm going to get, get the nicest house possible. Right? If somebody keeps offering him, climb the ladder here. He's like, no, just stay put. Be happy with what, where you are. Right? Be happy with where you are. In other words, don't get distracted again by possessions and material things and the niceties, the comforts of life. Not welcome, shake off the dust from your feet. Not welcome, go in the streets and shake off the dust of your feet. Kingdom of God is at hand. And then they return, explain what they had done. And notice the difference here. They return doing what? Rejoicing, there's a sense of joy. Now, so that, doesn't, that doesn't mean there wasn't a sense of joy among the 12, but it just added emphasis here that they came back joyful. A sense of joy, right? And this is, uh, you know, Pope Francis's first sort of, um, was it an encyclical that came out, was the joy of the gospel, right? The sense of the joy of knowing Jesus and the great gift of joy. Um, joy is just, um, I don't know if you're taking notes here, joy is the fruit of, of possessing the good. Joy is the fruit of possessing the good. In other words, if I have a candy bar, I possess the good, right? And I eat it, and I'm joyful for a little bit. If I have a good friend, and we have a great conversation, and we see a movie together, and we have um, some time together, you're like, this is just really nice. I have a lot of joy in just being with you. Those are natural goods. Food, friendships, people. Now we're talking about a supernatural good, which is an infinite good, which is God himself. And the saints would say, to possess God is my fullest joy. So there's that fruit of joy by being in beautiful relationship with the Lord, by possessing God himself. That's why the saints would say, I'm never going to be fully joyful until I possess God fully and definitively in eternity, until I'm with him one and see him face to face right so joy is the fruit of possessing the good okay now i love that pope francis says you know sometimes we as christians uh, when we leave mass or we leave these you know services and things like that we look like we're leaving a funeral right <laughs> sad with a dirge you know thinking well how is that going to attract anybody right that's not going to attract anybody a sense of peace and joy that we have this is uh, James Tiso here. Is um, he, he's just a good, he's a, just a nice job in, in his paintings and things like that. The sending out of the 72 here where Jesus is instructing them, getting them ready to be sent out. He is a late uh, 19th century, early 20th century painter there. Jesus sends out the 72. Okay, let us go down here to... Before we talk about that scholar, let's talk about this praise where Jesus praises the Father. And this is going to be verse 21. Verse 21, praise the Father. Here's what he says. At that very moment, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I give you praise, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. For although you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned, you have revealed them to the children, childlike. 
Yes, Father, such has been your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wishes to reveal him. What's interesting about these few verses here is this is one of the rare occasions in Luke's Gospel where you get a window into what Jesus says in his prayer. Many times in Luke's Gospel, you hear that Jesus went off to pray, and that's it. And you think to yourself, what is he praying? What is he saying in his prayer? What's the content of his actual prayer? And here, you get a sense of what is he actually, what's, you, get a, you get a window into his heart. What is he actually saying to his Heavenly Father here? And which gives us a window into how maybe we could pray as well. Now, in John's Gospel, you get lots of windows into Jesus' intimate prayer with this Heavenly Father. He gives you these long dialogues, or even monologues, if you want to put it that more of a dialogue, with prayers of dialogue, that Jesus has with his Father. But in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you oftentimes don't get that window into the actual content of the prayer. Does that make sense? I just find that to be really interesting, actually. And he thanks his Heavenly Father, which he calls him a Father, right? That's interesting there alone, because in chapter 11, he's going to teach us how to pray the Our Father. But he praises him because he has hidden things from those who are wise and learned, but rather revealed things to those who are childlike, innocent, humble, who are dependent and willing to be open to God in what he has revealed. Um, in this light, I have found a little quote here on your notes page there on the first side from St. Therese. And she is so good in this area, her little way, right? Her way of trust and love of becoming, trust and love of becoming like a little child. And here's what she says. To remain a child before God means to recognize our nothingness, to expect everything from God. It is not to become discouraged over our failings, for children fall often, but they are too little to hurt themselves very much. Thank you. That's just really neat. So she says the first part is, look, at the end of the day, without God, I'm nothing. Right? One of her famous uh, quotes is she says, God willing, you know, I enter uh, heaven. When I go to heaven, I will enter, I will, I will show up with empty hands. You don't owe me anything, right? Everything you've given me is a gift from you, and I simply give it back to you as a gift. So she comes with empty hands. And then she also talks about that children don't become discouraged over their feelings because they're too little to hurt themselves too much, right? Uh, and somebody this morning said, and children are really low to the ground, aren't they? So when they fall, they don't fall very far. So we are just children of our Heavenly Father, and when we fall, it's not nearly as bad as you think it is. The Lord has a plan, and he knows exactly what to do. So we should have become discouraged. So um, keep in mind that discouragement is one of the great tools of the evil one. He loves to discourage you. Big tool. Actually, it's a big tool that he uses against priests. Big time. We've talked, and the priests that we talk about this, you get discouraged that, oh, everything I do in the parish, is nothing's happening. What's the point? I might as well watch, go home and watch soap operas. What's the difference? Right? That's all discouragement. That does not come from the Lord. It does not come from the Lord. The Lord always encourages us and says, you can do it. Right? With my help, you can do it. So he's all about encouragement. Uh, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, somebody asked him one time, they said, what are the three most important virtues in the spiritual life? Like, tell us. And he said, humility, humility, humility. Because without humility, you can't get off the ground. Right? The evil one has no humility whatsoever. He does not possess that, per that, that virtue whatsoever. He's all about pride and arrogance and about self-will and self-reliance. He's not about humility. They sometimes say the devil has no knees, right? He never bends his knee. Never. Not to the Lord. And so we have knees, and we bow down, and we get on our knees, and we pray, which is a symbol of humility. I'm not God. You are, right? And I depend on you for everything. I'm a creature. You're a God. 
So those who are humble, those who are childlike, they are rewarded the most. They are rewarded the most. It would not be a bad thing in your prayer, in your spiritual life, to say, Lord Jesus, I ask that you would help me to grow in the virtue of humility. Please grant me that special gift to grow in humility. Do you think Jesus smiles when you say that prayer? He smiles very much. and He goes, yes, I'd be happy to help you to grow in humility. And you will find people who will come into your life and things that will happen to you that will humble you very much. Does that make sense? He would love to, to humble you very much if you ask for that particular gift. But that's all for your salvation. It's really good. Okay, verse 25. There was a scholar of the law who stood up to test him and said, by the way, notice that this happens right after his prayer where he talks about uh, the childlike and the humble. And then who does he introduce right after this? A scholar. And a scholar has a temptation for what? Arrogance, pride. I know more than you. You're less than me. I'm going to tell you a thing or two. I'm a scholar. I've done, I, have you seen my degrees in the wall? Take a look at them, right? So the scholar is introduced right after the prayer of humility and childlike trust. So this scholar is going to be humbled here pretty soon, isn't he? Through the Good Samaritan. He asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And by the way, eternal life, which we learn from, from the prayer, is to know the Father. To know our Heavenly Father on an intimate level, as Jesus knows him. To enter into that communion of love of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit with all the angels and saints. That's eternal life. Eternal life is, is about a relationship. Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? He said in reply, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. He replied to him, you have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. I find it interesting that Jesus gives him the freedom and wants to hear from him how he interprets scripture. Isn't that nice? Go ahead. You're a scholar. I would love to listen to you, right? How do you read it? And he gives him that freedom. He gives us the freedom as well to read the scriptures and to interpret it, right? And as long as it's with the church and it's a reasonable interpretation, how do you read it? And he quotes there the Shema prayer that Deuteronomy, uh, both six, chapter 6, verse 4 and 5, which is the Lord is only, there's only one God, and you are to love him with your whole being, right? With everything. You're to love him with your heart, it says here, your being, your strength. What's interesting here is Luke adds in, and with your mind, that's actually not in the Hebrew text there. So he's added in mind, or your understanding, and uh, your neighbor as yourself. It's also interesting that in verse 28, he says, you've answered correctly, you know this, but what does he add on? Do this, and you shall live. So a great theme of Luke's gospel is not just knowing, but also doing. We all know the difference between knowing what we're supposed to do and actually doing it, don't we? How many times have you said to yourself, well, I know I'm supposed to do this, but why don't I do it, right? How come now I'm not actually carrying through with it to do it? Because knowing and doing are not the same thing. We've all met people who know all the right answers, but they don't do the right things. So for Luke, that distinction is really important, not just knowing, but actually doing it as well, carrying it through with your will to carry through and doing it what you know is right as well. Now what we're going to get here is this parable of the Good Samaritan, which is uh, pretty fun, actually. And it's verse 29, where it says, But because he wished to justify himself, he said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? In other words, is my neighbor just my fellow Israelite? Is he part of my family? Can you help me with that? In other words, I want to hear your interpretation, Jesus, over neighbor. I have a feeling you have the definitive interpretation because you have the authority here. So he really wants to hear from Jesus. 
And he replied, Jesus replied, a man fell victim to robbers as he went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Okay, let me show you a little something here I found in a thing. Here is a map of the difference in height of Jerusalem to Jericho. So at the very top there of that mountain range, Jerusalem, Jerusalem is 2,540 feet above sea level. I mean, it's like way up there. Jericho, on the other hand, is 825 feet below sea level. It's the lowest, uh, well, the Dead Sea itself is the lowest point on Earth, but it's like really, really low. So this is a very steep decline going from Jerusalem down to Jericho. 17 miles of really, really steep, rugged decline here. Everybody make sense? Is that an easy journey? No. Do you and your like 85-year-old grandma want to take that journey like as a walking journey? No. Right? So that's a tough one. I have found a little map. Look at this thing. There's a road there, and you can see it's windy, right? And it's, it's dangerous, not only because you have the weather, it's hot, but it's narrow, and it's lots of twists and turns. And then also what's on top of it makes it even worse. A travel in the ancient world is dangerous, right? You get robbed. People do this all the time. They go grab, get, get the money from them, right? Get, get the food from them. So this is not uncommon for some. I mean, you kind of put your life in your hands if you're traveling by yourself, Right? So you, it was many times you got robbed or wounded or injured when you were traveling. It's not like today. You get in your car and you just go somewhere. There it's like much more dangerous to travel. So this is not uncommon for this to happen. Okay, it says that they stripped him and beat him and went off leaving him half dead. A young and handsome priest happened to be going down that road, but when he saw him, he passed by on the opposite side. He would never do that, by the way. He would surely help him out, would he not? Of course he would. Likewise, a Levite came to the place, and when he saw him, he passed by on the opposite side. But a Samaritan traveler who came upon him and was moved with compassion at the sight, he approached the victim, poured oil and wine over his wounds, and bandaged them. Then he lifted him up, lifted him up on his own animal, took him to an inn, and cared for him. The next day, he took out two silver coins, and gave them to the innkeeper with the instruction, take care of him. If you spend more than what I have given you, I shall repay you on my way back. Which of these three, in your opinion, was neighbor to the robber's victim? He answered, the one who treated him with mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Okay. Now, on this little scene here, I'm going to point out a few things for you. Here is an image uh, of, uh, from the mid-19th century here. And this is from Jose Manchola of 1857. So if you're like into art and things like that, like I am, I enjoy art very much. It helps bring this stuff alive. Um, you have a beautiful um, contrast here of light and darkness. So the light here is going to be, of course, where the Good Samaritan is helping the man who has been robbed. And if you look closely, his left hand has a little cup of wine and like the oil there. So he's got that in his hand as he's bandaging up his wounds there. Uh, you can see how vulnerable this man is. He's half dead or half naked there. Uh, what you can't see very well because of the projector here, but in the upper left-hand corner behind the Good Samaritan is actually the priest who's off in the distance. And if you look really closely, he's reading the Torah. Isn't that interesting? So he's reading his Torah, but he's not doing anything to actually help the man, right? So there he is. He's being a, a, a good Jewish person there, a right? good priest there to read his Torah, but he's not doing anything to help the man. And then uh, in the upper right is the actual, the, um, the donkey there, and it's actually tied up on the tree there that is just kind of parked off to the side as the Good Samaritan there helps uh, this man who's been wounded. Nice uh, piece for meditation uh, for you and I, how are like that Good Samaritan. Also have another image here for those of you that are like more modern art, uh, Vincent van Gogh uh, here. 
uh, quite the story behind this uh, piece, which is basically a replica of what he saw uh, where he was. So in about 1890, he painted this uh, while he was in a psychiatric hospital. So towards the end of Van Gogh's life, um, he really struggled with some mental illness and some psychiatric problems <coughs> that he was going through. So um, he's checked into a psychiatric asylum there in a small hamlet in the south of France. And he comes across this painting of the Good Samaritan. And he reproduces it and, and he paints it uh, here. And this is what, what we get here. I just find it really interesting that um, he comes across the Good Samaritan when he himself is struggling really bad. Does that make sense? So I, I'm assuming that the Good Samaritan painting probably touched him very deeply as these innkeepers are caring for him and helping him in his own struggles that he's going through. Tremendously gifted in terms of art and painting, but had some um, personal struggles that he's going through in his life. Uh, there, this Van Gogh painting. So this is where he painted that in 1890 with the uh, Good Samaritan uh, helping to get the man who was wounded up on his own animal. Um, a couple thoughts for you in terms of the actual story itself. Um, the priest who passed away, this is not a Catholic priest, right? This, is, this would be, to read it, uh, not in context. This would be a, uh, an Old Testament uh, temple priest, right, who's in charge of taking care of the sacrifices at the temple. And he's probably returning from offering his daily sacrifice, right, at the temple there and heading back. And most likely does not want to be defiled, right, because the man is half dead, right? So you couldn't touch a corpse, right? That would defile you. Uh, so he passes by the other side to preserve his ritual purity uh, there. The Levites, of course, we know that's uh, one of the tribes of the Old Testament that did not receive an allotted inheritance in land, but rather their task was to help the priests in their administration of the temple and uh, to watch over them. And some of the Levites were priests, but again, you see this kind of um, notable um, Levite here who passes by on the other side as well. We talked about Samaritans last time, right? The intermarriage uh, between the Israelites, the northern Israelites, and um, the uh, foreign nations that were around them. So they were considered half-breeds. They were considered heretics, idolaters. So um, in some cases, they were looked upon as worse than Gentiles, right? So they had a very bad reputation amongst the Jewish people. And it says that the uh, Samaritan comes by and he has compassion on him or has pity on him. Depends on the translation there. Compassion from the Latin would be to suffer with. He's willing to suffer with this man, which is really quite beautiful. By the way, it's the same verb, that compassion on him, as uh, in Luke chapter 7, verse 13, when Jesus went to Nain, and the widow was crying with her son. Jesus saw, sees the widow, and he has compassion on her. And then he raises the son from the dead. It's also interesting that on verse 34 and following, it says, when verse 34, he's 33, he sees him, but 34 and on and following, verse 34 and on following, he actually does something about it. He doesn't just see him, but he actually starts to carry through doing things for the man. Namely, of course, right, he uh, offers his resources, the oil and the wine, he offers his money, two full days' wages, and he offers his time as well. The next day, he's willing to come back for the man. Sometimes your time can be the most um, wonderful gift that you can offer somebody. I love when people say, thank you for your time. Very grateful that you've given me your time, right? I think of sometimes for um, people in material poverty, and we're willing to give them money, but to stop and give them your time and your attention. How are you? What's your name? How, what, how, how, you know, just tell me about yourself. Tell me about your story. Now you're giving them your time, right? And your heart and some affection as well. Oftentimes that's what they want as much as your material things is just compassion, right? A sense of heart. And then it's also interesting at the end that the scholar of the law 
He doesn't say, the Samaritan who treated him with mercy, does he? What does he say? The one. He couldn't even bring himself to say Samaritan. Uh, that guy who treated him with mercy. Like, he, he's really, he's struggling with this, right? This whole thing. And he's going, I guess the one who treated him with mercy, right? So this scholar of the law is being humbled here. So the church fathers um, love to give these spiritual interpretations to these, uh, to look at deeper meanings of them. And as you can imagine, they just had a field day with this one and the, and the Good Samaritan, all these different interpretations. And some of them are fun, and some of them you're like, okay, how are you getting that out of that? But um, some of them are a lot of fun. And here's some of their interpretation. And this comes from Paul Thigpen from Luke, Gospel of Mercy, where it says that, the man who fell victim to robbers half dead is a symbol of you and me, of us as humanity, that we have been robbed in some sense by the evil one and his kingdom of what God wants to give us. You remember in the beginning, God gave us original justice and holiness and all these beautiful graces and this intimate relationship with him. And the serpent enters in and we've been robbed in some sense of all the graces and the intimacy with God. The priest and Levite uh, symbolize the law, the prophets in the temple. They're good, but they cannot save us. The Samaritan with his own animal uh, symbolizes Jesus Christ who comes with a human nature, right? To save us and to uh, bring us back to health. Salvation, we call that. The oil and the wine symbolize the sacraments of the church. And the oil, of course, we know oil is used in baptism. It's used in the anointing of the sick. Wine, of course, is used in the Eucharist. So the sacraments heal our wounds. They heal our wounds. The inn and where the man is cared for, it symbolizes the church. And I love the fact that Pope Francis refers to the church as a field hospital. It's the place where we are healed and we find healing in the church. The innkeeper symbolizes the shepherds of the church who are supposed to take good care of the inn of the church or the body of Christ. The two coins symbolize the Old and New Testaments, right? So this great uh, dowry, if you want to put it that way, uh, that our Lord gives to us uh, with these two Old and New Testaments. And then finally, the Samaritan says, I'll come back again. If you need any more, let me know. And so that promising to return is the promise of the second coming of Christ in his glory, that he will come back again uh, to bring us and take us out of the inn into, right, the definitive inn, the wedding banquet of heaven itself, which the church is a symbol, a symbol of heaven itself. Okay. You like that or no? You like that? It's kind of neat, isn't it? Stuff like that's kind of fun. Uh, I got a picture here of Mother Teresa, of course, was the wonderful Good Samaritan to uh, thousands and thousands and thousands. Uh, I found a little quote from her. She says that intense love does not measure, it just gives. Intense love does not measure, it just gives. One of the things with uh, Mother Teresa, she's very quotable and she's very simple. She gives these very simple quotes that you can say, I can do that, or I, I understand that. Um, she, she's so childlike. She's so beautiful in the way. But she does. She puts into action her faith at every second, really. It's really she's just absolutely amazing. Her love for Jesus is unbelievable. Okay, did you have fun with Martha and Mary? Should we close up shop here with the final little scene here? Verse 38. As they continued their journey, he entered a village where a woman whose name was Martha welcomed him. By the way, in John's gospel, this village is Bethany. Bethany, which is two miles outside of Jerusalem. So in terms of the chronological narrative of uh, Luke and the geographical uh, reference, we kind of have a little bit of a problem here because he isn't anywhere near Jerusalem right now, is he? He's like way up north still. So scholars have kind of recognized this. It may be a different village than Bethany, but they've kind of scratched their heads and say, well, how did it get to Bethany? 
like that's way down south like he's up north right now so there's kind of a, a question mark there of how is that possible uh, verse 39 she had a sister named Mary who sat beside the Lord at his feet listening to him speak Martha burdened with much serving came to him and said Lord do you not care that my sister has left me by myself to do the serving tell her to help me the Lord said to her in reply Martha Martha you are anxious and worried about many things there is need of only one thing Mary has chosen the better part and it will not be taken from her nice little painting here uh, 17th century here of you have uh, Mary there sitting at the feet of our Lord this is the position of a rabbi with his disciple uh, the disciples would sit at the feet of the master of the teacher and they would listen to them in the wisdom that they would give. So she's in this position of a childlike humility and of listening to the rabbi, the, the teacher. And of course, we have Martha there uh, turning to her Lord, kind of a little anxious face there saying, what's the deal, right? Tell her to get off her tush and help me out, right? We can understand that. We all say, I, I get that. I can identify very much with Martha. We can enter into her, her shoes. What should we say about this? First of all, the parable of the Good Samaritan, which came right before this, tends to emphasize the love of neighbor. And now we're going to emphasize the love of God. And love of God is not just serving our neighbor, but it also is taking time to be with the one that we love. Right? Listening to him, spending time in prayer, and receiving from him. That's an expression of your love as well. Prayer is an expression of your love for God. Martha and Mary, it's interesting that Luke presents doubles or doublets a lot in his uh, narrative. So remember in the uh, chapters 1 and 2, he has Zachariah and Elizabeth as a double. Then he has uh, Mary and Joseph, right? And he has Simeon and Anna. And he has all these little doubles, James and John. Now we have Martha and Mary. So why does he do this? I have no idea. Right? He just likes it. This is one of his writing techniques. He just likes to present doubles. This is kind of one of his things. All writers have sort of certain idiosyncrasies, don't they? And you kind of pick up their traits. For those of you that like to read, you can kind of pick up on the traits of certain writers. Okay, uh, the village, we've talked about that. Mary is listening to him. Luke focuses on hearing in his gospel so often. So she is like the good soil. That's receiving the word where there's a lot of fruit that's being born here. So she's an example of good soil that listens or receives the word. And in, and in chapter 9, uh, with the transfiguration, uh, that voice came from heaven. And what did that voice say? This is my son. Listen to him, right? Listen to him. And so we have Mary now carrying out that command of listening to him. Now, as I read through this, like you, sometimes you get a little bit, you scratch your head and go, well, seriously, like, Jesus needs to eat, right? And somebody's got to do the serving. I mean, why, why, is, why is she getting the short end of the stick here, right? I don't understand this. Like, I got a little Martha in me. You have Martha. Some of you have a lot of Martha in you, right? You just love to serve, and you keep going and going and going. This is the first time in reading this over, though, what attracted my attention was not the serving, but what does Luke say about the serving? Is it light serving? He says, it's much serving, doesn't he? It's almost like she is overwhelmed by serving. Um, the serving has become so much that it's caused what in her heart? Anxiousness, anxiety, unrest, a lack of peace. We're not, we're not, in, the, we're not in the why right now. We're just saying, just notice that. Pay attention to that first overextending and serving without taking time for prayer is going to result in what in the heart? Anxiety, uh, depletion, emptiness, unrest, a lack of peace. So it's really helpful, tell us the morning crew, to pay attention to your heart. If you find yourself anxious a lot, you got to say to yourself, am I spending enough time with the Lord quietly? In prayer I do this all the time every day 
around three or four o'clock, I notice my heart is, gets to be anxious. And the Lord just says, come sit with me for five minutes and then I'll help you. And then you can go out again and continue to serve, right? And do what you need to do. So I make these little pit stops into the chapel, in the little adoration chapel, to get filled up again and then go out again. So that sense of the heart, if you're overextended, so a lack of balance in your life, well, you'll suffer consequences in your heart from a lack of balance in your life. Sometimes people say to me, you doing okay, Father? I say, as long as I get my prayer time in, I eat, well, I eat right, I have good friends, and I sleep enough, I'll be okay. But if you remove one of those things or you overemphasize on one of those things, then the car is going to get shaky and things are going to get bad pretty quickly. If you take away sleep, not good. You start eating poorly, not good. I'll be isolation without friends, not good, right? Take away my prayer time, not good at all. That's, a, that's really bad. So all those things, yeah, that, that's a nice house to build upon. You need those, those certain things and a well-balanced life for your nature, your human nature. That's the way we're put together. Does that make sense? So maybe you can ask yourself, how am I doing? Am I balanced on that? And how's my heart, right? Is I a sense of peace and rest there? She is serving. Her serving is good, but much suggests that she's too busy to pay attention. She's overextended there to pay attention. Luke here is hinting at the different types of soils that he talked about before. Remember, he had the path, the soil with thorns, the soil with rocks, and the soil that's good soil. So this is the thorny soil that is distracted with worldly things. Does that make sense? So the seed's there, but it's not deep. It's not able to go deep. Because it does not go deep, then it doesn't have the roots there, and it becomes anxious. Make sense? Here's another painting from the 17th century. I like this one. It's got the whole panoramic view there. You can see, look at the spread that she's putting on there, huh? That's a big spread there. She's got, I see fish. I see all kinds of meat up there, fruits, berries, potatoes, all kinds of stuff. And there she is complaining, right, to the Lord as Mary is doing what? <laughs> Sitting there with her scriptures right next to the Lord. She's like, what is the deal? If you look next to Jesus' feet, there's a four-legged animal there. That is not a cat. That is a dog. That's there helping and listening as well. There are no cats in this scene. No cats. They would probably be there eating the food and making things worse. Okay. Next time. What we're going to see next time in chapter 11, which is January 21st, two weeks from today. Your homework will be chapter 11. What chapter 11 is going to do is it's going to unpack love of God and love of neighbor. So some of the chapter is going to show you what it means to love God, and some of the chapter is going to show you what it means to love neighbor. So we're going to be unpacking the love of God and love of neighbor through some of these scenes and through some of this teaching, namely the Lord's Prayer. It's going to start off with the Lord's Prayer. So this will be a fun chapter. So your uh, task next time is to read through... Uh, chapter 11, and pay attention to how this uh, unpacks that love of God and love of neighbor. All right, looks like we're over again at 9.55. Uh, any, 8.55, what uh, questions do you have for me? Or if you're a little shy, you can come up to me afterward and you want to ask. Lisa, you have a question? Yeah, Luke doesn't give you that time reference, does he? So, and, and my other question is, what was he doing as they went out? Well, I, I have a good guess, because before he sends them out, what does he say to do? Pray that the Lord of the harvest sends out labors. So there's a good chance that he's spending time in prayer for the disciples and for receptive hearts. Does that make sense? So there's a good chance that he's offering his prayers uh, for them in their mission. And then when he, I, one thing I did skip here, when they come back and they're rejoicing, and what does he say to them? 
Don't rejoice because... Yeah, don't rejoice because of the power that you have, you know, that, that the demons are subject to you, but rather rejoice that your names are enrolled in the book in heaven. In other words, power is less important than relationship. Be more happy that you're, that you're going to be in relationship with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in relationship with the Trinity and all the saints. That's way more important than the temporary power that I give to you. Does that make sense? Every priest should remember that. We have a certain power that's given to us to forgive sins, to take care of the church, to consecrate the Eucharist. All of that is meant for what? Relationship. For bringing the church together, for building up the body of Christ, and for saving souls. It's all about relationship. Power is less important than the relationship. Does that make sense? Does it need more Marys or Marthas? Well, you want to be nice if we had a nice balance of the two? good balance, right? I don't think you need, those are certainly not competing at, at any way, shape, or form. There'd be nice balance with each other. And in fact, in your own life, you should have a nice balance of Mary and Martha, right? The saints have a nice balance of prayer and service. So um, I do my prayers, and that goes into service, and then that goes back to prayer. So it's this kind of nice flow that happens even throughout the day. There should be a nice Martha and Mary in your day. Does that make sense? Yeah, and how do you know those are the things that the Lord wants you to do? Like, you think they're what you're supposed to be doing, but how do you know you're supposed to be doing those particular things? That's your decision versus, Lord, what do you want me to do and who do you want me to speak to? Does that make sense? And also in the church, John tends to be more Mary-like, and Peter tends to be more Martha-like, right? He's just kind of a doer. He sticks his foot in his mouth. He just does this all the time. So this is a bad, you can see even in the early church, there's Martha's and Mary's there. Was there another question way in the back there? Yes, Gia. How can we make this a more of a modernity type of thing? So you have kind of two aspects here, don't you? You have a proclaiming is more of a teaching. So you have this kind of teaching aspect and a conversation that happens, a dialogue that happens. You know, today we're, in a, we're big into dialogue, which is fine, but this kind of back and forth and this teaching. So that's one aspect. And then the other one is the curing of the sick, right? So the sense of miracles that happens as well. In the tradition of the church, we have... Uh, even in the Mass, we have half the Mass is doing what? Proclaiming what God is speaking to me in His Word, stuff like that, so scripture studies, what's going on in your life, things like that. And then the second half of the Mass is a miracle, right? Right. So we have bread and wine that becomes the body and blood of Jesus. So you can kind of see that twofold word, sacrament, word, miracle, however you want to put it, um, even today. Um, well, how could that look for going out of families? You could have some teaching on certain things, and then you could say, you know, if they're open to it, what do, what do you say we say a little prayer about that? What do you say? Well, let's just ask our Lord to bless us and to help us with that. That's in some sense a miracle to even do that today, right? To, to stop and say a little prayer together. So that could look like that. Does that make sense? So it, it has different forms, but I think there is a, a sort of word or a teaching or a dialogue that 
happens, and then there has some type of prayer or even the sacraments that go along with it as well. And some people, let's be honest, because of their baptism, are given gifts that can cause certain miracles, whether physical or other kinds of miracles. Does that make sense? To take those baptismal gifts very seriously. Yeah. Is that helpful at LGA or no? Yeah. I don't think we would show up and just say, everybody, the kingdom of God is here. <laughs> That's right. You ready for this? <laughs> Yeah, that, that, we have to sort of put that in the context of what that, what that means. And by the way, all they're doing, he's telling them to do what he's been doing. Because when he showed up, what did he say? The kingdom of God is at hand, right? And he's been hearing and he's doing all that kind of stuff. So in other words, he's saying, you do what I did. I'm giving you the power to do what I did. To be my presence and my person to other people. Does that make sense? That's a great gift, too, to be the face of Christ for somebody in the hands and feet of Jesus for somebody. Okay, now that we're past 9 o'clock, we'll just say a little prayer here. And if you have other questions, just come on up and, and, and just ask me. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. Thanks, guys.